Well, I had this plan that if we took a break and handed out the report, everybody would just take the report and leave. <laughs> and the question and answer session would be short and sweet. Seriously, I think it's a, a tribute to the timeliness of the topic that so many of you come here and go on. And I, I know that what you'd like to do is spend a little more time thumbing through it. And you'll actually be able to do that because um, uh, I'm quite sure that there are a number of questions that are somewhat independent of actually what's in the report as well that we could uh, entertain. So our, our process is, uh, is we've got folks with microphones. Um, let's see, who's, who's got the mics there? Uh, Elena has a mic and uh, Jesse has a mic in the back. Um, so if you raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, put it in your hand, hold it up to your mouth, and uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, you have to actually, uh, nobody in this room is technologically uh, as unsavvy as I am. Uh, tell us who you are and, and where you're from and then uh, ask your question. So um, let's start. Um, here in the uh, middle, uh, and then we'll go to the to the right side of the room. Thanks. I'm Dick Venata with the Science and Technology Policy Institute, and uh, you've raised a set of options, and you presented them as independent, or they look like they're presented as independent options. What appears to be missing is the concept of an overall strategy and a linkage and relationship amongst options based upon an assessment of the factors that you have here, the cost the requirements, the needs, the impact, et cetera. So do you see yourselves building something that would in fact create a broader strategy or call for a broader strategy? Raising the second question, whose job is it to do that? There's actually a third question implicit in that uh, question. But let me, let me tackle sort of what we're going to do and then, uh, and then I think that gets partway to your question, Dick, but not all the way uh, to the end. Um, we recognize, first of all, that there are ways to assemble elements of the options that are not mutually exclusive. So these are not really, you have to pick option one, option two, option three, option four. And uh, uh, while I'm not going to uh, lean quite as far forward as, as my boss did earlier today, um, I think that it's quite likely that we'll assemble a, a, a set of, of uh, potential recommendations that would cut across and integrate from amongst the options and uh, other elements as well. The linkage of that to a broader strategy is, uh, it, it seems to me, um, you know, from a strategic planning process point of view, both a bottoms-up question, which is the way we're coming at it, but also a top-down question. And we're not necessarily, uh, at, in the current operation, planning on uh, coming at it from that direction. Um, it occurs to me that that's something we can think about, certainly, and, and uh, perhaps uh, take out from this the elements of, uh, of uh, uh, the path forward uh, that would be required to link to that broader strategy and that broader process. Uh, in terms of who's in charge, um, I'm certainly not prepared to go to that level yet, um, but I've spent a lot of my life uh, wrestling inside the interagency process, and the one thing we all know for sure is if that is nobody's in charge, then really nobody's in charge. And, uh, and I think that's going to be a critical aspect of it. It's not identified. Uh, either as uh, one of our evaluation criteria or as a particular set of options. And in some cases, it may be implicit. In some cases, we may have to make it explicit. Um, so I, I think we're sensitive to those questions. I don't know that we have a definitive uh, piece to each of them, but that's how I see them linking together. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Greg? Uh, everything you said was right on point. I don't think we go that far to the strategy. But one of the important things by going around to the different interviews and the different subsets of uh, stakeholders was that each were looking at the set the option to f to improve access from just their little window, and I think there's a value here of explaining that there are other there are other windows, there are other avenues. So we don't go all the way to a national strategy, but we do say we might want to stop looking outside the the one stovepipe. All right, other uh, questions here. While the mic's in the middle, on the, I'll do this side, and then then we'll move back over to the. Uh, to the other side. So, Jesse, we have a question right here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, assumptions and context are certainly very important for any study like this. And I just want to be sure that I heard you correctly. At the beginning, when you said that uh, the Long March, I believe, was the most reliable rocket, I, I didn't understand that. And by what criteria do you make that? And, and you are? 
I'm Patty Gray Smith, the former Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation at FAA. Got it. Thank you. Um, I would note for the record that the question of the long march's reliability being the most reliable uh, uh, launch rocket was actually not in our study, but in my boss's opening commentary, and he did. Uh, <laughs> um, but now I, I feel like the witness uh, for the administration who just blamed the president for my problem, and so that's not quite my, my ultimate objective here. Um, I don't actually have the data for for uh, for proving the validity of that statement, um, but given the um, catastrophic event scorecard, it's at least tied for, um, for, for uh, the top in recent times in different versions. I think that the question of reliability is certainly one of the issues that we're going to continue to look at. Um, I don't know that I would uh, characterize the outcome of that assessment at this stage. So, um, in a sense, I can't validate that statement, but I can't deny it either. And it's clearly something that we need to pay attention to and validate it one way or the other. Uh, we got a one over here, Elena. Thank you. If I were actually in a hearing, I would have said, I'll have to take that one for the record. <laughs> okay, um, Yoshi Koizumi from uh, Japan Aerospace Agency. Um, expanding the uh, commercial opportunity might uh, conflict to keep or maintain the sufficient uh, security level. And uh, this issue should be um, highly prioritized. Uh, it's very important. So how do you work out uh, to solve this issue? Well, the, the, the issue of commercial expansion versus security, of course, is kind of at the core of a lot of the government policy questions today. And your comment about should be highly prioritized, I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, although I, I, would, I would actually think that where we sit right now, virtually everything we've touched on here is high priority. I don't think we have anything in our report that, that falls in the category of second tier of, uh, of issues now, which is quite, makes it quite complicated and difficult to figure out. I think it, it's important though to recognize a couple of changes in reality, both with respect to security of an individual payload and with respect to a system that m manufactures that security through export controls and other technology controls. Um, the U.S. depends upon two things in order to maintain its technological lead. One is obviously the identification of critical <coughs> technologies that need to be protected in terms of who gets them and when they get them and what they can do with them. Uh, the second is maintaining that lead by continuing to invest and develop. Both of those have been key elements of our security for decades. But the world is so much different now, and it's not – Secretary Gates gave a speech last week. Some of you were probably at it. Most of you have read about it in terms of laying out the national security uh, challenge for, uh, for export control reform. And he put it in the framework primarily of we have a system built for the Cold War and we're not in the Cold War anymore. There was a, a very key sub-element that I think goes right to the heart of your question. And that is that in the past, it used to be that all good new national security technology was developed first within the U.S. national security community. And that is no longer the case today. And, you know, 15, 18 years ago, we had this big push for dual-use technology, right? Uh, my friend Dick Van Atta sitting there was a, uh, either a precursor or a harbinger. I'm not sure which. Um, but what dual-use technology meant in the early and mid-1990s was it was developed for defense, and then we figured out how to apply it elsewhere. We're in a whole new world of dual-use technology, where the technology being developed today is in the commercial global market. It's not being developed, and this is not true across the board. Obviously, there's plenty of key technology still being developed inside the national security arena. But increasingly, there are valuable technologies for defense and national security applications in use that are developed in the global commercial arena. And when you have a system that's set up based upon the predicate that you're going to have it first and then you figure out what to do with it, and you migrate that to a system that says somebody else develops it first and you've got to figure out how to get access to it, that's a whole different dynamic. And I think that's the interface uh, that we have to uh, approach the question that, that you've raised of the, the uh, interface of security and, and commercialization. We can't stop the growth of the global commercial markets. It's just beyond our capability. And we've got to learn how to accommodate and live within that. We've got to learn how to both adjust our policies and our approaches as well as 
what we depend on and who and how we accommodate those from a, everything from a contractual level all the way up to a, uh, a technology development level. Um, question in the back. I'm Basley Walker from the Secure World Foundation. Um, I, I noticed in your report when you're talking about uh, leverage with foreign launch providers, um, you put Ariane Spass and the Great Wall Corporation in the same sentence. Um, obviously, U.S. policy towards France and U.S. policy towards China are somewhat different. Has your study contextualized engagement with Great Wall or, or, or options like that in the greater picture of, of U.S.-China policy? I, 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 I missed the verb in your question. Would you repeat that again? Has, has, when you were looking at your study with your assumptions, were you looking at the greater picture of U.S.-China policy when also looking at export controls and future partnerships? Well, I, I could tell you that I'm still looking for exactly the precise definition of what U.S.-China policy is. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, we're, we're clearly cognizant of the, uh, the multiple layers of dynamics involving the question of, of use of China. Um, and occasionally, actually, those dynamics get in the way with France as well, although I, I think that's behind us for the time being. Um, but we're, we're cognizant of that, but I think we have to look at it analytically from the point of view of what's available today, and if that doesn't meet the needs, what has to change in order to allow those needs to be met. So, so we're, we certainly haven't taken off the table either policy changes or implementation changes as part of that evaluation, uh, but we haven't concluded what those uh, – what our recommendations would be in that regard. Sure. Uh, a couple questions up front here, and then, then I'll go to the middle. So why don't you go first, and then Vincent, oh, you're going to let him go first? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but just keep the microphone and hand it to her. Uh, Vincent Sabatier. Uh, first of all, with the last question, uh, if I remember well, all rockets are managed by the MTCR uh, regime, so it's, uh, it's missile technology, so we shouldn't forget that. It's a very important point in national security. And as far as I remember, China is not a signatory of MTCR right now. So that's the first point. Uh, but then I had a question about the, about the economic of the, <coughs> of the, of the study. Uh, we've seen recently both ULA and uh, the Japanese, our Japanese friends with the H2, they pulled away from the commercial market. The reason is, is it an industrial-based question or is it an economical question because there is no not enough market to sustain all those launchers. And when you see that there are only 15 commercial uh, uh, GTO satellites, clearly, and, and, and the bankrupt of sea launch lately, clearly there is not enough business for everyone. So how do you, how do you uh, assess the pure, purely economic situation of the, of the question? The assessing the purely economic situation of the question, and, and actually we, we get at this in our Fourth, uh, fourth set of options, which is are there ways to increase demand, uh, which would in fact be a fundamental way of changing the economy. Some of that will have to do with um, the evolution of the global market. Um, when I look out into my BlackBerry and I see the announcement of 3.2 percent real growth in the first quarter of the economy today, um, that's a positive signal. About Twenty years ago, I had the opportunity to study what we were going to do with the defense industry at the end of the Cold War and uh, how we were going to spend the peace dividend as if somehow the government was going to make that decision. But um, – uh, and one of the key conclusions was that there's almost no policy that will succeed in redirecting resources that would be better than 4 percent per year real growth around the planet. Right? So. Uh, to many ways, we're, we're subject, obviously, to, to where the global economy goes and where our own domestic economy goes. That said, I think there are a couple of interfaces that, uh, that come into play, and we want to look at how those interfaces do. Um, there's a big, big issue about how big do you need to be and can you use more and smaller um, so that the ratio of the cost of the payload versus the cost of the launch changes. And that, that's a, an, e an economic analytical dynamic that I think uh, bears some assessment in terms of where the breakpoints are there. It's not intuitively obvious. Um, the second actually has to do with a, a, a third element that comes into play besides just cost and, and demand, and that is the government's role in providing availability. Um, and for the government, uh, cost is not really the big driver, and time is free. It's way more important to make sure that you have 100.0% reliability of success for military payloads and the extent to which you've got an integrated approach, obviously, um, 
commercial payloads takes not only second page but probably last page. Um, that creates an economic uh, circumstance in terms of trade-offs that companies just can't live with. You can't live with the uncertainty, or not very often, of uh, we're not quite sure when, you're gonna, when your line will form, when you can get in it, and when you can get out of it, uh, and the potential for holding something up. And I don't mean to imply that we think that you should sacrifice national security in order to satisfy commercial launch demand, but I think there are potentially better ways to integrate those two. All of those taken together can change the economics um, and, the, and both the demand and, and the uh, availability side of it. So. I'm Robbie Sabatier. Uh, my question is with respect to the, um, the funding of the study. My understanding, um, I see John Warner here, Senator Warner here. I believe, uh, Mr. Kiley, you worked for Senator Warner, and I know John Emery is a good friend of Senator Warner's. Uh, we also know that Senator Warner has worked in the past, and I think currently, for the commercial satellite operators who have an interest in opening up the Chinese launch market to U.S.-made satellites. And we believe and we know that that uh, strategy failed on the Hill and with uh, the administration. Um, we did hear that they came to CSIS uh, asking for this study, which I understand is going to be an independent study, but uh, that perhaps they are partially funding it or have a huge interest in the outcome either because it will um, give them a reason uh, to say, look, we do need the Chinese market open because there's not a U.S. launch market, although SpaceX is trying to get into the launch market, and uh, opening up the Chinese launch market would kill that U.S. industry, that budding U.S. industry. So my interest is in um, are they funding the study, do they have a valid interest in the outcome, or is this truly independent? I think the, it's interesting you start out with that uh, Greg Kiley worked for Senator Warner. Uh, if you look closely at the record, you'll see that um, I actually worked against Senator Warner far longer than Greg Kiley worked for Senator Warner, uh, including four rounds of base closures, um, uh, which uh, I had the opportunity to, for him to uh, give me the, his, the benefit of his personal views of the wisdom of my course of action, um, <laughs> perhaps a number of times. But I think the, the, the point of your question is actually a, a very serious point. Um, let me describe to you how we undertake our work, particularly in my group, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group. Um, roughly half of our funding comes from corporate contributions to CSIS, and there's an internal allocation process by which uh, uh, those funds are, are made available. And from that, I create a essentially a, a core funding capability, which I use to do many studies, uh, ranging from examination of professional services contracts, contingency contracts in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, European defense industry, our own assessment of uh, the relationship of government policies to the perform financial performance of the companies, um, and independent assessments of particular industrial base issues. This falls into that category. There are contributors and sponsors who have multiple vested outcomes in the issue here, some of which are in comp direct competition with one another. We face that in almost every issue that we undertake, um, but I stand quite firmly uh, on the, um, both the independence of our assessment and particularly on the independence of our recommendations when we get to the end. Uh, I spent 30 years in this business. It's the only way I've ever done it. Um, this is the only institution I know that I would have come to work for uh, that meets that test, and I don't think you'll find a single bit of, of uh, evidence to impugn either the nature of the study or the outcomes. So your answer is no. Right. <laughs> okay. Nobody's influencing either what we do or what we say, other than um, the shortcomings of our own intellect. put it together. I didn't say we, he. And uh, when I was chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, there were certain critical periods at that time when I felt the United States Senate and indeed the full Congress needed an independent study. I turned to CSIS to perform that study. I was privileged that General Jones headed the panel. So from the get-go, to the extent I've had involvement in this, I can tell you this team behind me was fully independent, and had I ever got in their way, they'd have stiff-armed me, and I know it. <laughs> uh, 
I think, though, you know, the, the, the question really is a question of process, but I think the, probably the more important measure is the outcome. And I think I'm happy to let the study, when we're finished, stand for itself. And then any, any who have any uh, uh, questions about either the, the validity or the accuracy or the connection of the analysis to the findings and conclusions and recommendations will certainly have that discussion there. I hope that answers your question to some extent. Um, I think I had next promised that we had somebody in the middle here. Yes, sir, right there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ted Cron, Miller Consultant. Uh, you've noted in your study that the market for satellite launches is essentially flat for the foreseeable future. I think you've noted as well that there's ample capacity currently to launch what is expected to be available for a launch. In addition, there are going to be a number of new entrants and perhaps a reentry of, of an old outfit, Sea Launch. And the question that comes to mind is when you identify the risks, such as the political risk that France may change its policies to the detriment of the interests you see at stake here, or that there may be a failure among the mature and, frankly, fairly resilient systems that exist currently, have you quantified that risk? Have you attempted to see how realistic it is that France, for example, would change a policy in a way that would injure U.S. national security in this regard? And have you looked at how much of an interruption would actually occur in the event that one or more systems comes down? Thank you. That's a that's a, a excellent question. I don't think that we have successfully quantified the risk. I think we have attempted to uh, construct some mechanisms by which we would um, uh, do that quantification. Um, at a minimum, I think what we need to do is to sort of rank order them so that you've got some relative priorities of risk inserted there. Um, but quantifying it would require a level of sophistication of probability and and. Uh, outcomes that I think are probably beyond the scope of this study. Um, but what I think your question points out is uh, a more fundamental uh, um, issue, uh, which is we can apply sort of supply and demand and economic analysis to this uh, situation as if somehow that's going to give us all the answers, when in reality it's only a very s limited part of the overall uh, equation in terms of, uh, of both opportunities and decisions for individual companies, countries, or, uh, or um, uh, users. And uh, uh, the political dynamics and the government-related dynamics that come into play, if in fact we really do have flat demand, and I think one of the things we're, that we intend to, to comment on is uh, the reliability of that flatness of demand as a projection, because there are things that could change it, um, and an increasing number of potential suppliers for launch, uh, most of which are state-supported, uh, and state supported for reasons that have other than do with uh, some, something to do with something other than economic return on investment. Um, that's a very different way of analyzing and prioritizing, and I think uh, folding the risk and the threat associated into that is even harder. So uh, you know, I don't I don't think we've got that sorted out yet. Greg, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's part of the next step is to to try and put a little bit more rigor to the risk sets and the, and the relative, not an absolute figure, but the relative risks involved. But, and, you know, uh, Dr. Henry suggested that you were all here to work today, and I would suggest that any of you who can come up with a, a good approach to do that, I would be glad to double your current salary. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, that's offers not uh, to my staff. <laughs>been a while since I've had to exercise my Evelyn Wood speed reading uh, <laughs> talents. So I confess. That's why we give you a whole month, actually. So Thank you. Good. So I, I confess I haven't read <laughs> the entire thing just sitting here. Uh, but uh, the question I have actually is sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum of the gentleman's question, which I think was rather specific. Mine has something to do with a much messier topic, and that is Congress uh, and uh, the, the political element that needs to be factored into whatever analysis can, is conducted here. Now, I did see a couple of references in my quick review uh, to some of the activities that Congress has undertaken with respect to export controls in particular, uh, and hope that, you know, we'll see the Senate acting on uh, returning jurisdiction, et cetera. Um, my question, though, is to what extent do you anticipate your report will factor in uh, what is inherently a messy component of uh, the policymaking process, and that is uh, the very um, intensely competing concerns uh, on Capitol Hill around 
not only uh, protecting you know, discrete district specific uh, elements of the industrial base, uh, but larger concerns about national security, uh, especially with respect to specific countries. The, the, the larger national security concerns, and both with respect to export controls and with respect to some of the other congressional actions, um, CSIS has had a long-standing change advocate position on that, uh, dating back through a number of studies uh, over the last decade and beyond. And, uh, and of course, our, our uh, uh, president and CEO has been on the lead of that, as, as he puts it. Uh, He's, he's already undertaken three kamikaze missions on export controls and, and is about to undertake a fourth, and perhaps the target will be uh, better identified and, and established this time. And, uh, and, you know, my group has a similar track record, in, including a uh, uh, report that we put out in the spring of 2008 as well. Um, we are in the middle of a host of activities related to try to move the ball forward on that. It's not at all clear to me that that will end up in a report because I think we're more at the stage where we're interested in providing a forum for, um, for debate and, and uh, uh, collaboration. I was going to say compromise, but that's usually a bad word even though it is ultimately what we have to do. Uh, uh, amongst all the various competing elements both inside the administration with the Congress and, and those handful of other folks who can contribute intellectually without, um, without biasing the, the outcome. Um, I think we're in a, a unique situation in terms of the potential for real successful change here uh, for a host of reasons. We're early on in the administration. Um, we have a, a, a very um, uh, dynamic and capable cabinet officer who's pushing hard for change and who's had a track record of being somewhat successful in the last few years for the things he takes on. Um, uh, we've got the changing uh, technology and, and global uh, economic dynamic uh, underway. Uh, we've got, I think, a clear recognition that um, uh, we have the potential for national security harm from failing to change as opposed to national security benefit from failing to change. Uh, a number of other reasons, I think, uh, uh, we've got uh, the, the nation faces an opportunity here, and, and uh, even the Congress uh, will recognize that, and I think there's a potential. Um, whether or not there's enough time left between now and the end of the 111th Congress to succeed or whether what we're really doing is setting uh, a very capable and, uh, and thorough and a comprehensive stage for the 112th Congress to pick something up uh, next year, um, you know, as anybody's guess. I, I once stood up in a public platform in July of 1996 and guaranteed the audience that there was no way that welfare reform would pass that year. And uh, six weeks later, this president was signing it into law. So I don't really uh, uh, want to predict where momentum will go, but, uh, uh, but I think the stage is very well set. Uh, the issues are very well engaged, and this will play clearly a part. When we put out our 2008 study, and as I mentioned, we started looking at the industrial base and ended up coming to the conclusion that export control reform was a, uh, a real both a fundamental cause of problems and a real driver for dealing with them. Um, we said at the time that space and the space industry in general and particularly key elements were like the canary in the coal mine. And, uh, and you really had to look because it, the, the, even though the dollars were fairly small with respect to overall national security expenditures and, and the national security technology environment, um, the relative importance of that contribution both to overall national security and to, uh, to the national economy was way beyond the dollars being invested in, and spent in it and that if we were losing our technical edge there as a nation, both from a security point of view and from an economic point of view, um, that it really would, would make you ask where else are we losing and, and what are the potential consequences there. So it's, it's bigger than just a space issue. I think it's a, uh, a very strong uh, signal, um, but it's also potentially a pretty strong horse to pull the, uh, the wagon. Um, I hope that responds to your question. Uh, Greg, you have something else? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, two seconds because I've not here, I've not been at CSIS as long as David. I've only been here 18 months and this is about my fourth effort that I participated in. But one of the things CSIS prides itself on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is the, uh, the analysis of practical solutions, things that can act are actually feasible. And one of our criteria on, uh, for the evaluation is this feasibility question, which goes to all of what David was saying. And I wanted to just stress that point. On the side here, yeah, right behind you, Phil. Thank you. I'm Phil Spector with Intelsat, and I um, 
wanted to start by just saying Intelsat is the largest purchaser of commercial satellites in the world. We're also the largest purchaser of commercial launches in the world. So we obviously welcome this study. I wanted to take exception with the statement that was kind of made in passing by the woman a little while ago uh, to the effect that somehow having the Chinese a part of the normal commercial launch market uh, would kill uh, innovators like SpaceX. Intelsat is one of the largest fans of SpaceX for obvious reasons. We want more launch alternatives, and SpaceX is part of that. But to say that somehow by protecting our domestic market, we're going to get there, and that somehow by not having competition and distorting the normal workings of a commercial market, we're going to somehow have a better outcome for somebody in the U.S. when we haven't had anybody in the U.S. succeed at commercial launch in many, many years is just wishful thinking. Intelsat buys all of its satellites from U.S. manufacturers, from Boeing, from Orbital Sciences, and from Loral. We buy none, unfortunately, of our launches from U.S providers because there are none available. We had one commercial launch on the Atlas rocket last year. That was something that was ordered many years ago and, in fact, took a very long time and with many delays to get up in orbit. We buy all of our launches from the French and the Russians. And we would like to see, for that reason, a lot more competition in this marketplace of all kinds. The China problem particularly, though, is one in which I think Dr. Hamry's point before about the law of unintended consequences goes into play. You mentioned, and it's a key part of your study here, the U.S. aerospace industrial base. One of the unintended consequences of current China policy is that we are directly harming the U.S. defense and aerospace industrial base. What's happened is that foreign satellite manufacturers, TALUS in particular, have designed around the ITAR requirements that prevent launch on a Chinese launcher. They offer ITAR-free satellites. Those satellites, the ITAR-free satellites, mean that there can be no components manufactured in the United States. Someone mentioned Congress earlier. Interestingly, component manufacturers for satellites are located in 49 of the 50 states. So there's some political interest here in strengthening the U.S. defense and industrial base as it comes to manufacturing satellites. We don't help that at all by encouraging foreign satellite manufacturers to design around U.S. components. But that is one of the unintended consequences of current policy I don't know to what extent your study addresses that. I haven't had time to do my own speed reading, but I'm hopeful that the final study will address that point. I was, uh, I'm mindful of uh, uh, Senator Warner um, when he would occasionally look down at some of the lesser mortals who were members of his committee and uh, say, Senator, is there a question in there? But uh, you, I don't think I detected actually a, a question that I have to respond. Oh, at the end there was a question, whether it's in the study or not, uh, to a limited degree. Um, it is, but I, I think, uh, Phil, you'll see it much more in the results of, of the analysis uh, because it's clearly embedded in at least two and perhaps three of, of the option sets. Uh, options one, and I think to, to a lesser degree, options two and three will uh, will all address those uh, that that question of whether it's in the study or not. I, I was I was nervous because I kept thinking you would get to the end and there'd be a question mark and I would have not paid close attention to the front end of the sentence uh, uh, there. But uh, but I think I hope that responds to your question. It's you won't find it to your satisfaction in this version of the report. You will find it teed up, I think, to the extent that uh, that we'll take that on. Um, let me go with the the person in the back. And then I, I know I've got at least one more over here. Before I go back for round two uh, with anybody, I'll, I'll try to get the round ones first. Hi, I'm Marcia Smith with SpacePolicyOnline.com. I'm just curious about why you decided to limit your study to medium and large payloads to GAO instead of looking at the whole launch market. As the table in your report shows, there does seem to be a fairly healthy forecast for NGSO launches in the future. And I'm sure you're more interested in the future than in today. So. We 
Why did you do that? We, we are. Uh, the reason we did is because our, our initial assessment was that that's where the stress and, and the, in the uh, interface between both demand and supply and on potential government involvement came into play. Um, I think we'll have to look, in, as we do our continuing evaluation, at the sensitivity of that restriction to whether it changes the outcomes if we would ex expand that restriction to the, to the uh, smaller. Or uh, for, for non-geostationary uh, uh, orbit, though, um, I think the fundamental requirements uh, just don't meet. I mean, our, our basic thrust is uh, starting with the national security implications of that. And from uh, that's where the, the prime emphasis is from a national security perspective in terms of both the domestic capability that national security relies upon and the commercial global capability that national security relies upon. So that, those were our two fundamental. Do you have additional? Uh, all right. Um, I think I have an unanswered person over here. Please raise your hand if you all if you're in think you're in line and I haven't called on you yet. There's one there, there's one there, and one there. Okay, good. Okay. Speaking of Congress, uh, I'm Dan Els from the Congressional Research Service, and uh, the question I would have, I'm I'm basically a quantoid at heart, a methodologist, and looking through here, I noticed that as far as hinging the arguments on ITAR uh, impact of uh, export controls, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to be a little thin on the actual um, data that would back that up. And I'm currently undergoing or going through a literature review to try to ascertain if there are any studies out there that actually use hard data on the impact of export controls on the defense industry in general and space in particular. And I'm wondering to what extent have you found some actual hard data on not only the dogs that bark, let's say export licenses that are denied, but also the dogs that don't bark. Industry has stated anecdotally many times and in many studies that export controls are adversely impacting our ability or willingness to try to export. Well, there is no data to back that up unless you can provide it. What export licenses do you not ask for because of the current structure of the system, et cetera? So to what extent will your um, study pry open that particular box? Dan, you have you have raised the probably the key most unsatisfying element of, of this whole thing. Um, our 2008 study started on the premise, based upon the survey data that that, that study was done on, and was government survey data uh, mandated by and collected by the Commerce Department, analyzed uh, by the Air Force uh, in in collaboration with us on that study, and uh, and. The smoking gun is very hard to find. Um, I, I think the, the way uh, uh, the co-leaders of that study described it is we can't find the smoking gun, although the smell of gunpowder is in the air. Um, but the reality is that you can find anecdotes, but you can't array the data in a way that CRS would certainly find uh, satisfactory. Um, and my sense is that we're still not at the point where we can prove the case. Um, I'd be happy to be proven wrong here. Um, my concern, though, from a policy perspective, is by the time we get to that point, it's too late. And, uh, and, and it becomes an irreversible dynamic. Um, what we've got is a lot of, I guess, you know, I'm not a lawyer, right, but circumstantial data, uh, the decline in, uh, in, in technology share, revenue share, uh, share of patents, um, the fundamental premise, unprovable in, in uh, a direct way, that uh, new technology developments will come elsewhere. But I will cite for you a parallel that did actually have data. Um, I had the privilege a couple of years back of chairing the National Academy of Sciences study looking at printed circuit boards. Um, and defense reliance on printed circuit board, and in many cases these are neither printed nor boards, but they do still have circuits. Um, and, and, and there the, the global market has clearly gone in both of the directions that I described earlier, away from U.S. dependent to global market. U.S. has maybe 3 percent of the global market share now. It used to have 50 for many years and at one point had 100. Um, and the increasing or the diminishing role that defense 
plays in that process d o d is probably you know thirty percent of the u s market and one percent of the global market actually i probably have those numbers too high and all of the new technology developments or for the consumer commercial market which doesn't really care about one hundred point zero percent reliability your cell phone fails throw it away and go buy a new another one in fact they're kind of happy if it fails just not too quickly and very little it has to operate in in areas of high physical demand there are commercial industries that do replicate both the demand for one hundred percent one hundred point zero percent reliability and and successful operation in very extreme environments and some of those operations have clearly demonstrated the ability to have indian supply chain control over the critical elements of technology that go into even the critical subcomponents of their uh, printed circuit boards. Um, and DOD has not learned the lessons from those other technologies. One example, for instance, is the medical devices industry, um, which uh, um, has a, a fundamental um, need to have that reliability. They, as luck would have it, have a cost structure that allows them to recover the cost because we'll pay anything it takes to keep us alive. And, uh, and they also have a tort structure, which will make them pay anyway if they don't. Um, and it's hard to replicate those for, for DOD. Um, but there, it, it's clear, and, and I, I, you know, the, the evidence is, is would satisfy even a quantoid, that uh, um, the market's gone a different way. Um, we are buying parts, DOD is, with part numbers, and we have no idea where they came from, what's in them, or what they'll do. They just have a national stock number stamped on them, and we're using them, and they're going into critical systems. Um, we don't do that with space. We're a little better than that with space. Actually, now that I think about it, some of those boards may be in some of our satellites, um, but we won't go there today. Um, that's as close to a smoking gun as I can come, but it doesn't prove the case on export controls. In fact, it almost proves the case other than that. Um, because these are commercial consumer kinds of items that are uh, that have essentially stayed outside the bounds. If I'm not careful, I'm afraid I'll create an opportunity for Congress to set up a new wall here, and uh, and then we won't be able to do anything uh, in that regard. For we do actually have indigenous domestic fabrication plants that serve the DoD market at remarkable inefficiency, enormous cost, dramatically reduced performance, and in many cases, not even as good a reliability. Um, that's not the answer. That never will be the answer here. I'd like to have the same case be made for um, uh, the launch business, but it's way more complicated than just the components of printed circuit boards and way harder to get and improve the data. That's the best answer I can give you on that point. Um, I think I had three more in line here, one here uh, in, the, in the front second row. Uh, Jeff Bowles, Futron Corporation. Did you look at the role that NASA can play in stimulating commercial launch demand, both with the ongoing commercial cargo uh, programs for ISS and the proposal in the FY11 budget for commercial crew and how that might further stimulate uh, additional commercial launch demand? NASA gave us quite a bit of excitement early on in the uh, process here. We did not anticipate the President's budget decision and had not incorporated uh, that into our, uh, into our approach at all. Um, and clearly, um, both at, at the, at the uh, intersection, uh, particularly at the industrial base level of where uh, the manned space flight changes in NASA strategy, whatever that ends up being, um, uh, or have whatever ends up funded in the final budget, um, and, and its impact on the supplier base uh, clearly has an impact. I think from a market driver point of view, there's an impact. I don't think we can quantify that. I actually can't tell you what I think Congress is going to do. Um, and um, you might could tell me what you think Congress is going to do, but uh, um, but we're going to have to see how that plays out. Um, you know, they haven't even given the appropriations subcommittees their allocations yet, and so I have no idea what running room um, they have for for the NASA budget inside the the FY11 appropriation. So um, I don't. I think we're going to continue to watch that and see how it plays out. I think at the at the technology level, there's clearly an interplay, um, but. Now I'm back to Dick Van Atta's question, which I failed to answer at the beginning, which is who's in charge of this? And, uh, and I, I don't know the answer to that question. And I'm, I suspect we'll probably try to tackle that in our recommendations, but perhaps not with a single point recommendation, but a set of criteria that whatever decision has to be made would have to comply with. Well, two wanna, yeah. Just a two-second follow-up. 
Um, we started the study, like David said, before uh, the NASA decision, but I think that NASA decision um, kind of highlights one of the points, one of our key starting points, which is that the four sectors are inextricably linked. And making a decision in one sector without uh, thinking through the implications and ramifications for the others is not good policy. And I think Secretary Gates was the one that was testifying in front of Congress when asked uh, if he had been consulted. And uh, I think his response was not adequately was on his on-the-record response. That was on the record, and um, okay. our discussions subsequent to that have, have not shed any new light on, on the coordination process for that decision. Uh, uh, yeah, more, more specifically, we haven't found any evidence that Secretary Gates was wrong when he stated on the record not adequately. Um, I think we had one over here and, and one in the middle. Let's, let's try the one on the, uh, the edge first there, Jesse, easier for you to get to, and then come around the other way. Uh, J.R. Dreyer, consultant. I'd just like to start off with a comment on the CRS question that uh, the Academy has produced a, uh, uh, a book called Beyond Freedom not too long ago on ICAR. If you take a look in the back and see those tables, some of that data is going to be you might find of interest. But what I'd suggest is you get the, uh, the, the director's name who works over there, and, and she can provide you with some additional details. I've worked this in the past. A large problem has been proprietary information that to sign an agreement you can see it but you can't quote it somewhere my second qu uh, second part of this is I've been I had the opportunity to comment on many of those studies that you started out at the beginning and what I find both there and here is a lack of asking of answering the question where do we want to be what is that balance between military space civil space and commercial space, and that's going to change five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years out, and I'm just wondering why we haven't looked at it from that standpoint. Why we haven't looked at it from the perspective of where do we want to be. I think uh, I would characterize that as, as you know, we, we've got this policy that says assured access to space, but it, it doesn't quite answer the question, for what? And, and for what? I actually think, I mean, my personal opinion here, and I, I really think this is beyond the scope of this study. But my personal opinion is we've got a huge vacuum in terms of what our real space objectives are. And, uh, and parts of that vacuum are uh, by default and parts are by decision. Um, and, uh, and I would personally love to see a, a, a broader effort that would tackle that question. That said, we obviously have to assume something. And I think it's incumbent on us, and, and as you've noted, um, uh, often been lacking uh, to clarify what those assumptions are. Um, as we've met with a number of the folks who've done some of these studies over the last three, four, five, ten, twelve years, um, particularly those that uh, have had phrases in them about the importance of commercial space in whatever area they're looking at, and then when we've asked them, okay, what exactly did you do on the commercial space piece, the most common answer we got was, well, we didn't really have time to get to that, so we just kind of put it in there. And uh, um, I, I would like to think that, you know, that's all, that's, we're not going to have that same excuse when we get to the end here. But I, I take your comment very carefully and, uh, and thoughtfully in that regard. Uh, we've got time for one last question, and it's not going to be, because uh, uh, I, I did, I am mindful of the clock here, um, but I'll be happy to stay around and take some additional questions from folks uh, a, as we wrap up. Carissa Christensen, the Tory Group. Uh, well, first let me say I applaud the process that you're going through of seeking input. And I think that a consequence of that is going to be uh, that you are uh, suddenly going from a very challenging data pull process to a perhaps overwhelming data push process that will be coming towards you. Uh, there are many people in this room who will have comments to make about the complex data sets that uh, you have used. Uh, I'll be coming to talk to you about launch prices, which uh, I, I believe have gone down over the last 10 years, and we'll provide some our, our view of that, and you'll assess that. Uh, my question to you is, do you have the flexibility, if you need it, to take the time to revisit your conclusion? So you laid out a schedule, and I, I, I've done quite a few studies. That's a, that's a demanding schedule to get comments by the end of May and then put out your results by June. And uh, I, I just would like to hear your thinking about how you're going to manage if you get a, a sea change in your thinking or a fundamental change in the data that shifts the way you view things and requires additional analysis? That's a great question. And, uh, and I, I actually um, 
wake up to that question more than once a week. Um, we're going to stick to our timetable in terms of completing our, this version of our final report uh, because we think we owe it to the ongoing process inside Washington to, to do that. But we, from the beginning, have not seen this as an endpoint at which we then put our feet up and say, okay, that's done, now what? Right? Um, we're both hopeful and anticipating and I think planning for uh, continued effort on beyond that. And uh, um, whether or not it is a further elaboration of the broader topic here, a movement into some either sub-elements or related assessment pieces that come into play, because obviously this is much more than just launch, access to launch. There's a lot more issues on, on the table here. Um, uh, remains to be seen, and I think we'll have to prioritize depending on, you know, w partly where uh, the opportunity to influence the public policy decisions uh, lie there, because that's our real motivator, and that's what our charter says. That's what we're here for, is to, to add value and contributions to that public policy debate and to provide the, the analytical underpinnings to assist there. Um, I think it's, it's also true and, and very worth noting, uh, because if we're asking you to put some energy into giving us input, we have to assure you that uh, we're very comfortable um, being smarter tomorrow than we are today and uh, are not going to be wedded to any place where we are right now if, uh, if in fact, the, uh, the facts and, and our analysis don't support it. So um, I'm with that, um, I want to sort of terminate the official portion of this because we have reached the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank you both for your participation and interest this morning. Thank you in, in anticipation of your continued involvement and input. And if we get overwhelmed, um, then uh, we'll deal with it as best we can and, and try to sort out, you know, my, my, my line between the spurious and the serious will be determined by the volume as well as the uh, uh, importance, uh, the content. Yeah, but uh, uh, we'll do the best we can with all that comes out. And I think your presence here indicates that we're not wasting our time by doing that, and, and we're very grateful for that. Thank you all very, very much.